welcome a special bonus edition, weekend edition, holiday weekend for US and Canada. A, a wonderful special guest duo on an incredible project they're doing. Welcome Hilary Brath and Janice Booth, and they are here to talk Socotra. Hello, everyone. You've been on my interview wish list for a while, and we'll talk a bit about your your life and career as a publisher. But first, we'll get to the main event about Socotra, about this project that we are looking to support. We've got a deadline of uh, September 9th to fill in the, uh, the to push you over the edge to publish this guide for the future of Socotra. That's right. The, the deadline is actually Tuesday at midnight our time. So that's a bit earlier for you guys in, in North America. But uh, this crowdfunding campaign has been a wonderful opportunity to be able to publish a book that we believe so deeply in. But because of COVID-19, we hadn't actually been able to afford to do it without outside help. And uh, the response has been absolutely brilliant. Well, that's that's fantastic, and uh, it's it's been great to see how different travelers, different businesses have found creative ways to respond uh, during this time. It it must be incredibly hard for your business to uh, push through. So I admire the creativity, and and we hope the guides keep coming in in many forms. Uh, why Socotra? Why Socotra? Well, um, I've wanted to go as long as I can remember. I think it was a talk that I went to back in the, probably the 1980s, um, by someone who'd been there on an expedition. And I sort of notched it in my brain as somewhere I'd like to go eventually. And uh, then I started looking into it really seriously about two years before I actually went there, because it's an incredibly difficult place to find out about. And uh, that's one of the reasons we want to do a guidebook. And uh, Janice, who is going to appear briefly Hello. on the screen. <laughs> yes, Janice uh, decided she would also join me. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, some of the um, people following this have probably been to Socotra. And I think it's one of the few places that we've both been to that surpasses expectations. You you literally find yourself gasping with amazement at just the variety of landscape, the extraordinary trees, um, the colours, the, the just everything about this very little known island. Yeah, I, uh, I've i got uh, your, I think it's page 221, a somewhat older edition of, of Yemen that uh, I used for the very small Socotra chapter uh, mm -hmm. in my own visit last, uh, so April of 2019. And I, uh, the, the flight schedule at the time was once a week. And so I was concerned about spending a whole week there plus the transit time, plus the flights were midweek. So it really meant two weeks for me. And I, I was, like you said, in incredibly impressed by the variety of activities. I was the, the famous trees, the dragon's blood trees are the one that, that people who have heard of Socotra know about, but the say the beaches, the dolphins, these towering sand dunes over the beaches, such such a variety of wildlife that, that I didn't expect. And and uh, yeah. in other parts of the world it may be it would be covered with five star resorts, uh, you know, built up on these beaches and dunes. And here it's just beautiful, uninterrupted sand line. Yeah, that's what's so extraordinary about it. You've got perhaps the most beautiful beach in the world, that's sure, and no one there except a few local people. And this, I'm afraid, will change. But um, visitors, um, good eco-tourists, deserve to see what's there because it is, as you say, a most extraordinary place. And you were very lucky, Stefan, to go for two weeks because we only made it for a week. And uh, we really want to go back because uh, that, that's far too short. But uh, there are only weekly flights, so it's either one week or two weeks at the moment. Well, you can't go at the moment, but when you can go, uh, who knows how, how long one can stay. Yeah, and uh, we've got some of, uh, some of the people who've traveled with you and supported the project. TK Kim, he wrote, I guess he was on the same Trip is you and Matthew Rachel, who uh, has been involved in this project. So we've got a lot of fans here. 
That's great. That's uh, great. Go on. Hello, PK and Matt. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, when I was there on that visit, uh, the, um, the I stayed at the hotel in in Haribo for a few nights, and there happened to be uh, the environmental minister of the country and some uh, UN and other NGO workers and local officials having meetings each evening talking about the future of tourism uh, in, in Socotra. Was it going to be um, uh, you know, on a larger scale? Was it going to be very limited ecotourism focus? So I'm curious in the, in, in the intervening year and what, what you've learned on your trip, what, what the approach going forward that uh, you think the island will take Yeah. Um, so, so it was what? Um, what was the approach to tourism? Where, where yeah, you are? going forward. Yeah. yeah, it looked like the connections a little. Okay, the connections back. Good. Thank you. I I think the thing is that anything that we learned then has changed uh, both by COVID and a fairly complicated, shall we say, political situation. So. What we learned at the time um, probably won't be relevant even by the time the book's published. And, you know, it is a huge wait and see situation. What the people want is quiet ecotourism because they understand the importance of the natural heritage. But it's going to be very difficult to prevent, if one says the wrong kind of tourist, it's, uh, it's, it's not the right term. But the beaches are magnificent. They're, they're a magnet. We have to wait and see. We don't know. I'm sure you know the political situation at the moment is completely fluid. Um, from week to week, we don't really know who is running the island. <laughs> at the moment, it's the Southern Transitional Council, who are a, a breakaway Yemeni group. Um, but uh, the UAE have got their eye on it as well. Um, it, I think within the next few months it's going to change quite a lot and I think then it'll be possible to see which direction they're going in for tourism. At the moment it's, it's all in balance. Yeah, I was amazed when I was there that my cell phone kept going from network to network and it would give me those text messages. It would say, welcome to Oman, welcome to United <laughs> Arab Emirates, yeah. welcome to Saudi Arabia. It never said welcome to Yemen. <laughs> Yeah, well, welcome to Saudi Arabia, we got quite often. It was lovely, we went to Saudi Arabia without even knowing we'd been there. <laughs> we and are the having a, a little issue with the video signal, and I think it, it may just be the phone connection, but the audio is good. So I think we will just continue with the audio. And uh, uh, that's just some of the challenges of live streaming with, with connectivity. Um, <laughs> So uh, J Janice, if you could if you could lay out so let's say the typical visitor is going to expect a week, what what are the regions? What's the itinerary that that you're going to recommend in the book? It's fairly prescribed by the um, existing local tour operators because what they have to ensure is that the that at one site you don't suddenly get three groups turning up and at one campsite you don't get more than one group turning up. So they've got quite a complicated logistical operation to perform themselves. So the places that one goes to working around the island, you start generally with the Ahaf National Park, which is the nearest place to the airport, which is a wonderful introduction to, to bottle trees, um, dragon's blood trees, a wadi with a stream running through it. Um, it's, it's very typical Socotri scenery, and you can be plunged into that. Um, Hadibo, you try not to spend too much time in because it's not the most attractive of towns, as you will have seen. Um, but it's practical. There are shops there. The people are extraordinarily nice. It's a horrible place, but it, they're, they're <laughs> lovely people. Um, Working, working around the coast, then Delicia is the first real chance you have to swim in the sea. That's about 30 minutes out of Hadibo. Um, working further east, there are two protected marine areas where you can snorkel, weather being good. And then the wonderful sand dune at Ahair, which is enormous. And our group, well up in their 60s, I would say, had a wonderful time climbing up it and sliding down again. And um, we, we watched more peacefully from deck chairs. <laughs> the eastern tip of the island is wonderful. Two oceans meet, the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. 
And you can stand there feeling like, I don't know, Columbus, um, mm -hmm. surveying new lands. A uh, place for shipwrecks as well, but spectacular scenery. Uh, the, the beaches are crushed coral. Um, see, it's, the place is shaped like a trilby hat. You've got the crown in the middle with the mountains, and then you've got the brim all around the edges. Um, and so this is part of the brim with the sand dunes and, and the sea. And it, the scenery simply changes as you work around the island. You, you go from sand dunes to cliffs to, to forest. Um, it's, it's a circular tour and you can just about get it in in seven days, but it is much better to have 14. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, I can, uh, I don't even know what a trilby hat is, but your, your description is so <laughs> evocative. I can picture it. So I can see your, I can see your skill as a writer already uh, <laughs> evoking these, uh, these places. <laughs> I think it's a fedora. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, I've just pulled it up, and I see. Yes, it looks uh, it, it looks handsome, and uh, uh, that's a, a wonderful description of the place. I think um, we talked about the political situation is very fluid, but there it 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 is a very distinct place from mainland Yemen, as, as I understood from my visit. There are no guns on the island in terms of locals being armed. There are some security forces from different countries that have been in and out, but it's not a place where there's been active fighting of the sort that's that's reported on mainland Yemen. And the part of the tragedy has been how, how cut off this, this remote uh, island has been because of no-fly zones and such. The extraordinary thing is the, the sides are very antagonistic to each other, at least each wants the other out. Mm -hmm. um, but Nobody wants anyone to get hurt. <laughs> and they've mm -hmm. been having little, over the past few months, they've been having little flurries and a few mm -hmm. tanks have rolled in the streets and a few shells have been fired off. But there have been no, no deaths, no, no serious injuries. They, they had a coup in June when yeah. the Southern Transitional Council removed the Yemeni administrators. And, and moved in. And again, as coups go, it was the gentlest thing you can imagine. Um, there's been a little, they, they say they, they fought each other with their hands. So there are little skirmishes every so often when they, I don't know, they slap each other or they throw a few punches. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they run each other's flags up and down as well. They, 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 side at the moment puts their flag up on the flagpole and then a couple of weeks later that's taken down. It's very gentlemanly. Mm -hmm. And really, nobody wants anyone to get hurt, which is a great reassurance for tourists. And our local guide, when he met us at the airport, he said, "This is the most, uh, this is the safest country in the world, in the world." And mm -hmm. I think, true, you know, there's, it's absolutely safe. I think it's something to um, emphasise for visitors. Um, you know, there's not even much traffic on the roads. So you're not going to get run over, unlike Cairo, which. So you take your life in your hand crossing the road. So um, it's, you know, that that was a great relief and, and a great um, happiness, I think. Yeah, and certainly that island living, I remember talking about the itinerary and it would be, say, point A to point B, about a 30 minute drive. And they'd say, oh, that's so far, you need to spend the night at that one if you're going to go. <laughs> you know, so. 30 minutes uh, for uh, my U.S. driving is, is just, you know, going to the grocery store sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's a, it is a very different perspective. And, and the, the moment I most enjoyed of, of how quirky and different the island is for my own visit, I kept, in the emails leading up, they kept emphasizing that they have a shortage of eggs. Huh. And... And I said, you know, I, I enjoy eggs, but I haven't asked about eggs. I, you know, it's not, I didn't require an all egg diet or something. And, and, and so when I got there, I finally asked, I think it was the, the owner of the hotel. I asked, what, what is the deal with the eggs? And he said, well, he said, we, we love eggs, but we hate chickens. So, <laughs> so the, the, the eggs come from mainland Yemen because we don't want them here, but it's been cut off for years. So we've had very few eggs the past few years. And, and, uh, and then it got into a discussion of how they also don't have dogs because the entire island is free range wildlife and the dogs would harass them. So it, uh, you know, what, what an education of, of uh, interesting uh, 
culture and lifestyle that uh, you know, I was, was very happy to encounter. You see, everything about it is different. Mm -hmm. it, it is an extraordinary place. Shortages of eggs don't feature in too many places. I have to say, we had a lot of eggs. We were perhaps very lucky. Yeah, well, when I was there, there were lots of eggs. So I, it, it, they had already reestablished the egg, egg, you know, the egg corridor, I suppose. But it, <laughs> at least it, it, it got me into a interesting discussion about their agriculture. And uh, um, so you, you've only got this week uh, to put together the much of the research for this guide. The, the earlier Yemen guide did did have a framework around the island. Talk talk about how you're making that time work to. To put together this publication. Um, yes, yeah, since, since we came back, um, I mean, we there's never been a brat guide that's been written after only a week of research, and it sounds appalling. You know, usually the authors will take uh, a month or so researching a book, mm -hmm. but we've been extraordinarily lucky of having some absolute experts. I think seven uh, people, uh, five of whom have doctorates who've been studying different aspects of Socotra for years and years and years. So we've got a bird expert who knows everything about the birds, a plant expert who knows all the plants, um, culture expert, a poetry person, and they've actually fleshed out the book. We were just doing the index, or Janice was just doing it today, and we were seeing just how much contributions they've made, how many contributions. So. We couldn't possibly have done it without these experts. We've done as much research as we can, but mm -hmm. um, you can't pretend to know a place after a week. But I think the book actually is very authoritative because of these different voices. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And I'm thinking I've got uh, more show and tell. So uh, here's the Syria guide. This was my UN 193 just uh, a year and a week ago. and. Uh, of course, it was it was published nearly a decade ago because of the the conflict uh, there. There certainly wouldn't have been a, a market for a new Siri edition. But how much of it was was evergreen? You know, practical information may have changed, of, of course, and certainly dramatically in a country such as Syria in terms of food, dining, but the the cultural background, the natural background, the extensive chapters on the natural world in every guide are. Are timeless in in many cases, and so that the Syria guide that greatly informed my trip. That's great, and actually, that's one of my favorite Brack guides. That the the uh, author Diana Dark has gone on to write several wonderful books about Syria, and uh, not guidebooks, but but um, explanatory books, documentaries. And she, she's a terrific writer. And uh, I was very pleased when you said you'd use the Syria book. I thought, oh, good choice. That, that's great. Yeah, I've got quite a many, actually, as I, as I looked at my, my recent uh, trips, again, getting, getting on my every country in the world goal. Uh, uh, you all had coverage on the outer Seychelles, so not just, not just the main island. So that accompanied me, uh, Eastern Turkey, because uh, Turkey was one of the, the few countries that I had I had saved for a big trip, and I started in Bonn, Eastern Turkey, a road trip all the way across the, the southern stretch of the country, uh, uh, Kurdish areas through the coasts, and then up up into Thrace and, and Istanbul. And, and of course, your coverage on Eastern Turkey was was superlative, and and uh, greatly informed that trip. So I'm I am a big fan. Uh, Kevin in the audience says I'm sure everyone here would say Brat's guides are the best being made today. Surely the Socotra guide will be no exception. Uh, he's looking forward to it. Um, we, we are huge, we're hugely proud of it, I must say. I mean, we, we can't be modest about it. We think, we think it's terrific. <laughs> uh, I live in Washington State in the U.S., which uh, is home to Rick Steves and his business. And every year he has public uh, talks and uh, that I've uh, attended a, a year ago. And... and um, one of the questions from the audience was, uh, would there be a book on, uh, it was, I think they're asking about um, Slovenia or Czech Republic. And, and he said, he said, there's no way I can make a profit or, or sell a book, you know, anything Eastern Europe to the degree that, you know, Western Europe is my focus. I stick to it. I do great guides and I have to keep a mind for commercialism. 
Uh, and I, I greatly respect his work, but I, that makes me even more greatly respect that you you have the determination to put out guides where, where nobody else can, can imagine there's a market. Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, it's, um, I wasn't a very commercial publisher. I was running the, the business alone for quite a few years, and I just did places that I wanted to do. And uh, I, I padded out my income by tour leading, which, which uh, helped. So it was Peru and Bolivia and Madagascar. And, you know, if someone suggested a really eccentric place, I think, oh, yes, you know, Niger, yes, why not? Nigeria, yeah, that sounds great. But it's paid off because a lot of our competitors have fallen by the wayside. But if you produce the only guide to Kazakhstan or whatever, people, not very many, but people will buy it. And so it's just much more rewarding than doing Western Europe. But, you know, that's the personal opinion. <laughs> well, we, you're, you're, you're talking to the audience that, that, that doesn't need to be convinced of the destinations, but we do have a lot of very young travelers that, you know, a physical book is a foreign object and an ebook even is, and they always say, what's, the guidebook is a relic. I can find everything I want on Instagram and that. And uh, what's what, what's your answer for the place of the guidebook in, well, we'll say 2021, assuming travel is getting back in 2021. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I'm i optimist. I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm sure it'll get back in 2021 because people mm -hmm. won't be able to resist traveling, particularly the adventurous travelers. Um, it's interesting, we, in the 19, no, I suppose in, in the sort of early part of about seven years ago, all the media were full of, oh, it's the death of the guidebook. No, it's mm -hmm. the internet. You can get all the information you want on the internet. And we just didn't really believe it. We felt that you need the physical presence of a guidebook. And actually, if you're going to somewhere like Kazakhstan or, or, or even Madagascar, you're not going to get a proper internet connection. You're going to draw attention to yourself with your device or whatever. And a book is just so solid and easy. And anyway, an old dinosaur, and I prefer books anyway. But, you know, we're, we're not alone with, with that attitude. And it's come back. People are now enjoying books. And we do do e-books as well. So we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're up, up to the future with that. But uh, we'll go on doing the print books because that's what we like doing and what seems to work for us. That's, uh, that's fantastic, and I, I, I think what's what can get lost, even if I mean, there's so much online, you might be able to replicate some of the information by spending five or ten times more of the time, but also the the comprehensiveness is lost. I think the the first brat guide I used was for uh, Paraguay, which is a, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a it's a quite varied country, and. Uh, um, there, there's not the one obvious itinerary. You've got a capital in the middle and you've got different directions to go and backtracking. So something like that, where I went systematically just chapter by chapter. And that's a practice I've continued of trying to have a picture of, of all of the regions of a country. And then from there, piecing together what's my interest and how an itinerary works, whereas so much of online is just immediately towards, you know, this is the top site, or these are the top 10 places. Mm -hmm. And it, you're not going to find a way to get that, that comprehensive picture of a destination. Exactly. It's, and I must say, I hate this whole trend into the top 10, you know, the, the highlights, the top 10, the, the best. It's, it's so boring. <laughs> I think proper travelers want to get off the beaten path. They want the, the bottom 10, not the top mm -hmm. 10, because there's always something interesting where you go. And actually another thing about a printed guidebook or an ebook from a publisher is it's properly researched and it's properly checked. You know, a, an editor has gone through it, experts have gone through it, and the author really uh, isn't allowed to make the sort of mistakes in a print book that you can make online. So it, it does lend reassurance to the reader, I think. And uh, Michael, who shares a, a, a picture of a whole bookshelf of your titles, he, he's curious. <laughs> How well did your North Korea guide sell? I, 
I own it and brought it with me during my visit, and it was very helpful. Good, I guess. Even you want, we weren't allowed to take it with you because of, I love North Korea. It was just the most fascinating, different, intriguing, um, safe place almost I've ever been to. And I always say to people, even the boredom was interesting. <laughs> that went wonderful way. And, uh, and Kevin's asking, is, is there any plan for an annual e-subscription uh, for uh, all, all, all of your... Uh, uh, titles. Uh, sorry, an annual e-subscription. E e um, we now have a travel club, um, which um, is one of our COVID uh, enterprises. So, I, uh, quite honestly, I don't know. <laughs> People, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just the founder. I'm just an author. I'm still a director of the company, but the real business side is, is done by the Brat team. So bratguides.com will tell you all sorts of useful things like that. Okay. And uh, um, you're downplaying your, your role in this, but uh, the follow-up question is that uh, you are a Madagascar expert. So if you had to choose the North, the West, or RN7, in Madagascar, um, yeah. I think the thing is not to try and go everywhere. It is, it's compared to Socotra particularly, it's a huge island. I mean, it's uh, two and a half times the size of, of Great Britain, uh, about the size of California, I think. Um, and it's difficult. I love the East because I love rainforests, but it does rain in the rainforest. Uh, I love the North, I love the South. I love the West. Um, I think you just have to go four times and you go to the East and then you go to the North the next time and then, then the South. The South, um, perhaps similar to Socotra, that has the most bizarre vegetation and uh, some of the most interesting people. So possibly if I were choosing, if I could only go once, um, I would probably focus on the South and perhaps the West uh, because the weather is better and, and hope to get back for the east and, and the northeast, which is also quite lush. One of the cultures that I've, I've found sometimes the most impenet impenetrable to me is British culture. And a few years ago, I got your uh, Brat newsletter with a new title published with this, this title that I knew could never, never exist in America. So I'm, I'm curious, the cultural insight of Britain's best small hills. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't really have big hills. We have, we, we're terribly impressed with our mountains and the highest one is 4,000 something feet high and that's in Scotland. So um, we don't do very well in height. So if you want a little workout and you walk up something that you Americans would call a mole hill, then you go to one of Britain's small hills. And I'm sure it will be a huge hit in North America when you start getting into it. <laughs> yeah, it just, it, I couldn't imagine an American marketer using that term and, and it working, right? Everything has to be a superlative and you do have the best, but it just, <laughs> but uh, it, it sounds eminently practical and sensible, but it's uh, so quirky. <laughs> The um, uh, one one uh, question uh, also that came in is around um, uh, every traveler probably at some point thinks they have a a book in them, and you have not only published guides but also travel literature, and it's it's one thing to dream of of making a book or even sharing uh, some some emails or pieces with friends and family that are disposed to look at it. It's it's quite another to make an interesting travel book that that would appeal to uh, readers uh, that that have never heard heard of you, for instance. So talk about the for the aspiring travel literature writer. What what works and what mm -hmm. doesn't from a, a commercial uh, publisher aspect. It's really, really hard. You know, we do a, an annual sem seminar on uh, travel writing and it's excellent. It's, it's, it's very inspiring and we have the best tutors and, and, uh, and, and very good advice. But 
it's very difficult to be positive about the possibility of getting published. And very sadly at Bratnow, we can, we try and do one or two that are superbly written, but mostly, and I hate to say this, it, it has to be someone who's either absolutely terrific at marketing or someone who is well known. I mean, we took a step into royalty. We did a, a, a nice book about cheetahs by um, Princess Michael of Kent. And mm. uh, that was quite handy because she was a princess and royal family and, that, and she mm -hmm. did quite a lot of publicity. So that helped. We haven't managed to rope in the queen yet, but uh, you know, okay. we're working on it. But, um, you know, all I can say is write um, as well, learn how to write well. And it is a craft that, that you can learn and make sure you have a good story to tell and, and just do it. If necessary, you may have to publish it yourself. But if it's good enough, it will get picked up or it should get picked up. And I wish I could be more positive. I wish I could say to all the listeners, oh, send us your manuscripts. Of course, we'll publish it. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, send us uh, your ideas. Or we might say no, but uh, it won't do any harm. We're, we're a lovely small company. You know, there's only 15 of us. And mm. so... It won't get, it won't disappear. It will get answered uh, eventually. And uh, we do consider everything that comes in, but uh, don't hold your breath. And uh, Janice, you've, you've uh, written several of the slow travel guides around uh, Britain's special places, as it's called. Uh, I have not as extensively traveled Britain as, as I wish to. One of my projects this year had been intended to spend more time. I, I've been up to Hadrian's Wall and in some spots, so I'm not guilty of, of London and nothing else. But um, when I see some of these names, I, I maybe know them from a Sherlock Holmes story or, or a media reference, but I don't have a, a, uh, a clear idea in my head of, of some of these. They, they all look wonderful by the covers. Talk, talk about the ones you've worked on and as well some of these these wonderful special places in Britain. Hilary and I have co-authored three guides to Devon now, um, mm -hmm. to, the, to the south, to the north, and to the east. And that's been fascinating because what we try to do is find the, the, the quirky places, the places that you, you wouldn't find in another guidebook. And also, it's, they're, they're slow guides, in inverted commas, um, advising people to take their time, get off, walk about, really look at what, what is around you. Don't whoosh through on a, on a tour or on a bus. So our slow guides to Devon have really shown us such a lot about Devon that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Wonderful little country churches, tiny things which have been there since, since um, I mean, a, a thousand years and more. And you think of the feet that have trod their way to those doors. Um, exploring the, the land around where you live is wonderful. That's, that's what we've been doing locally. And the whole range of, of Brat um, Britain guides now has really taken off. It's doing very well indeed. Fantastic. And uh, for the Devon trips, uh, where would you base yourself then uh, for, say, a few weeks? We've, the way travel may shape up in the coming months and several years, people might base themselves for a couple of months in a place and, and, and really explore. Yes, I think that's a very good idea. I think it depends enormously what your interests are. Um, somebody who loves beaches is not going to settle in Snowdonia. Um, I, I think, and I think it's a very difficult question to answer that. Um, there are hot spots all around Britain, in fact, which you could, which you could choose. You're never far from the sea, it's, it being an island. Um, mm. I, I have no favourites. Wales is beautiful. Go explore Wales for a while. Um, Devon's the best. Hillary is saying Devon's the best. Devon, it is very, very varied um, because we've got coastline. We've got we've got the two moors, Dartmoor and Exmoor. Lots of trekking. Little villages, pastel coloured houses, thatched houses. Um, it's very appealing for the traveller. And actually, we do get a lot of Americans coming over, and th and they do enjoy it. So I guess I should base myself wherever the Americans are not, or where in Devon, where's where's the good uh, base or two to think about uh, plunking yourself down for a few weeks? 
I find it very hard to answer. I'm going to ask Hillary. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> I, it's not even in Devon, but the place I love is Porlock, which is in mm. actually it's, oh, it's yes. in Exmoor, and we love Porlock. And it's not um, it 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 has literary connections because um, if you know. Coleridge and, and the person from Porlock who interrupted Kubla Khan. Uh, they got its, its name into history or into literary history. But it's just one of these small, unspoiled, untouristy uh, places with wonderful walking nearby, um, good beaches, good, um, just wild coast. And um, I love it. I love it. But um, as Janet says, it, it depends on your interest. I think one warning to Americans is the roads here are absolutely ghastly if you're used to American roads. A lot of them are single track, which means it's just about the same width of your car. You know, uh -huh. drive along hoping you don't meet someone. If you do meet them, you have to be very good at reversing. Sometimes it's a bit of a high noon standoff with each glaring at each other. But being British, we're very polite, and so we tend to both reverse and lose sight of each other. But it is pretty horrid. You know, if you arrive at Heathrow and rent a car and drive down to Devon, you'll have a nervous breakdown by the time you get here. Okay, yeah, it reminds me when I picked up my rental car in uh, in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. They said, "Are you are you sure you're ready for this? <laughs> please, 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 please bring back the rearview mirrors." <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it can be a bit nerve-wracking. I want to ask Janice to tell you about the other guidebook that she wrote about Rwanda, because it's a typical example of how a BRAC guide gets um, sparked off, what sparks it off, and a place that no one was going to when it was written, and is now one of our steady bestsellers. So I'm handing you over to Janice. Fantastic. Yes, Rwanda. Um, this I, I had a I had a Rwandan friend. Uh, well, you know the, the genocide was in 1994, and uh, a tenth of the country was wiped out. Oh, you're probably too young to remember very much about it, but I was watching the news very carefully at the time because I had a Rwandan friend there, and he suddenly went silent, and uh, so I assumed that he had died in the genocide. And I tried all I could to get news. And by the year 2000, I thought, no, this has gone on long enough. I'm going to go there and see whether I can actually get some news about him and his family. And at that time, the media were being utterly negative about it. Oh, dangerous country, still tainted by genocide, um, foreign office warnings in, in force about not going there. And I, I'd never been, I, I had no idea about it. And so I, I bought my ticket and I went over and I discovered this absolutely stunning country. It is so beautiful, which I hadn't been prepared for. And I was asking questions of anybody I could find who might be able to help me to locate Peter. Um, and one man said, yes, I can get you news, but I can't, I can't do it immediately. Give me three or four days and then I'll get back to you. And so in those three or four days, I set off to explore the country. And it's very small. It's less than half the size of mainland Scotland, so it's very little. And mini buses were running to all corners of it. They were held together by string and cello tape, but they were still running. And I felt absolutely safe. And I traveled around at every corner you turned on the road. There was a new panorama stretched in front of you. Land of a thousand hills. It yeah. certainly is. Land of 30 something lakes, I believe. Um, very hilly, green, green beyond belief. And I got back to the capital Kigali and I um, contacted Hillary and said, you absolutely have to do a brat guide to this country. Mm. And she said, well, you'd better write it then. And so I, because I'd been, I'd been editing and proofreading for Brat for several years by that time. So I, I knew the setup. And um, we, we got Philip Briggs, who you've probably come across, writer of a lot of the other Brat uh, Africa mm -hmm. guides, and he did the wildlife. 
And um, I went back to research it, and the people were incredulous. The, tour, the tourism department had been on the verge of throwing up their hands. There was such a feeling of collective guilt on whatever side you were, whether you were victim or perpetrator, guilt that this, this could have happened in their country, this appalling thing that had been the genocide. And they didn't believe anybody would ever want to go there again. And when I said I book, they, they, they were polite, but didn't believe me. And in fact, it took off. And to fast forward several pages, I had to encourage tour operators to put Rwanda back in their brochures. And one said to me, but who would lead a tour there? And I said, I will, <laughs> um, and took tours there. And we went for a fortnight and people said, what are you going to do in a fortnight? I said, don't worry, we will find things. There are the gorillas, of course. I mean, there's no problem about that. But we just ex gently explored the country and they were astonished by its beauty and its safety. And one really touching thing that happened to me while I was there on my second visit, I think, after the book had been published, I was at a hotel beside Lake Kivu and there was a Rwandan family sitting and I saw they had a copy of our guidebook. And so I went over and introduced myself and it turned out that they had been in exile, their whole family since the 1960s, the time of independence. They'd come back to Rwanda after the genocide when it was safe for them to do so because Tutsis were no longer persecuted then. And they were using our guidebook to find out about their country, which they mm. had never visited. And this was absolutely great. And it, it has remained the only complete guide to Rwanda. Um, it's now in its seventh edition, seventh edition um, from the first one in 2000. And it, it was an extraordinary experience for me. Um, and yes, I found the family of my friend. He had died and I'm in touch. And his daughter has just had, just this week is having her first baby. So um, it's it's been an extraordinary experience. I'm glad Hillary introduced it. What, what, what an incredible story. And uh... As, as a country on my own visit, uh, just even so, so many cities in capital cities in Africa get uh, downplayed or travel advice of just pass it. But Kigali, be, partly because of the tragic history, I suppose, this incredibly young, energetic population and just the, the vibrancy of the city was incredible. The hills you mentioned and the gorillas, there's, there's much more. I would like to see so that's that, that's incredible and it's and the, the sites related to the genocide are very harrowing very very well yes. preserved uh children yes. uh, what children under 13 are not not allowed to visit some of the sites because it's it is it is overwhelming it's uh, very yeah. very graphic they, they, take, they take very seriously their responsibility to remind the world that such a thing must never happen again. So the genocide site and the museum have been very, very carefully curated. They're very carefully looked after because they owe it to the world. It's not just, it's not just Rwanda's own genocide. Mm -hmm. It's a world event. Well, such a beautiful story, but we, we, we don't want to end on, on that moment. So we'll, we'll bring it back to, uh, uh, Socotra and the the temporary uh, signal connection we had is gone. So we see your your smiling faces again. And uh, <laughs> I've, I've shared the crowdfunding. I think since I posted yesterday, we've gone up by five hundred. So it's uh, eleven hundred pounds to the to the final goal to to support this, and that's uh, that's wonderful to see. So uh, the 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 future of travel for Socotra, and I think when you mentioned the story about Rwanda, that shows the potential of what what a guidebook can do to put it on the map so encapsulate that that of, of, of what the future of Socotra travel is and, and what the guidebook will contribute to it i i think that's it we want the world to know what could be lost if if it isn't taken care of and a guidebook is is the thing to do that that is wonderful thank you both hillary and janice for joining us tonight yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.